Well, we're interested in uh, posing such problems for school children to uh, improve their physics skills. We have a project to do this. And while we were involved in these chain pickup problems that are a classic problem in mechanics, uh, as you begin mechanics, came this uh, footage from Steve Mould. I've got a jar here which is full of a chain of beads. There's about 8,000 beads on the chain. It's 50 meters long and it behaves in this really weird way. And 2.85 million other people looked at it as well and were utterly fascinated by it. So uh, we wanted to see whether or not we could blend this uh, research project, because nobody understood the mould effect, with the problems that the children are doing. Now normally, because physics is a, a linear subject, it takes school children many, many years before they get to a real research problem. But in this particular case, we can bring them to this research problem using the physics and the maths that they know from their uh, AS level and A level studies, and they can actually, by the end of a short series of exercises, actually be predicting how high the chain fountain should rise. There is a lot um, of research on chains going right back to Robert Hooke in the Royal Society. He was the first to try and figure out how chains hang under their own weight. And then in the 1850s came an urgency to understand how chains moved along their own length, because that was when uh, people were first laying submarine cables for telecommunications. And that uh, led to the Astronomer Royal writing a paper on this in the 1850s. By 1854, it was in the Cambridge uh, Mathematical Tripos, the physics of chains moving along their own lengths. And then it came into mechanics books already in 1860. But nobody before Mould had seen the chains rising up in this way. So that problem is actually a new problem. So we've got a little schematic of the, of the chain fountain drawn here. So here we have a pot containing a blue chain and then it rises up some distance and then falls down to the floor where it collects below the pot. So the first question, which people on the internet have theorised about, I think, very correctly, is what causes the chain to flow from the pot to the floor? And that's really down to gravity. So the floor is lower than the pot, so it is releasing gravitational energy as it falls down. In particular, in a fourth way of thinking about it, this part of the chain is longer and therefore heavier than this part of the chain. And so gravity pulls down harder on this part of the chain, because it's longer, than it does on this part, and therefore this part of the chain is pulled down, and that drives the flow. So the next question is, why does it turn round? Um, or how does it turn round? And so the, the natural suggestion from what we've just seen, which many people have made, is that it is driven around by gravity. So it is somewhat like throwing a ball up and down, where you throw the ball up, and it falls back down under gravity. However, what's going on here cannot be quite like that. You can see it can't be quite like that, because when the ball goes up, it stops at the top, turns around, and then comes down again. That would suggest the chain would be stationary at the top of the chain. Uh, but if the chain was stationary here, then it is flowing in at this point, but stationary here, so it should be piling up in this region. And that's clearly not observed. So what must in fact be happening is the chain flows around this structure at a constant speed, um, as shown by these Vs on this diagram here. Um, and so the question then is, if it's not gravity that turns it round, what does turn it round? When things go around in circles like this, they need an inward force to make them accelerate towards the centre of their motion. And you see uh, an example here of a ball being accelerated towards the middle, my hand, by the tension in the string. So where is the inward force for the chain? Well, the chain is under tension, and when you have a curved uh, trajectory for an object under tension, then there's an inward component of its force. So we can demonstrate that with the chain. If I hold the chain under tension and we place on top of it a pen and it's pushed down, then it, the chain is going around the curved surface of the pen and then... What we showed in our work was that in order to explain why the chain rises above the pot, rather than simply dribbling over the edge of the pot, we had to introduce a new force into the problem. So we had to say that when a link of the chain, the link right here, which is about to be pulled into motion, when that link is pulled into motion, two forces contribute to it moving. There's a force from the chain above it that is already in motion, and that's the one you would expect. But in addition to being pulled into motion by the chain, it must also be pushed into motion by the pot. 
And without that extra push from the pot to kind of kick the links upwards, it would never make this leaping effect above the pot. To understand where this pushing force came from, we thought about our chain as being consisting of these rigid rods connected with short, very flexible little joints. So it's a rod and a joint and a rod and a joint. And then these, this chain of rods is resting on this hard surface, which is the table or the pot. And then what we noticed is that when one of these links, so this is the link that is already moving, and this is the link that is about to come into motion. And so it is pulled into motion, not by a force from its, through its middle, but by a force at the end, because that's where the next link pulls it from. So I've drawn a little diagram of that here. Here is the link, this link, that's about to come into motion, and it's being pulled into motion by a force at this end. But because that's at the end, it causes two things to happen to this link. It starts to rise up, but it also starts to rotate. So if we pull it at this end, in fact, a little time later, it will be in a position something like this, where it has indeed risen up, but it has also rotated. Now, if that were the whole, that's what would happen if there were no table. But if we put the table back into this diagram, the table would lie here. And what you can see is that the combination of the lifting and the rotation has caused this end of the link to go beneath the level of the table. Now, clearly, the table is going to prevent that. So what must happen, therefore, is that the table itself must provide a great big force at this end, a kick. And that is the extra kick from the table, which causes the fountain to occur. So I've got here a physical model to illustrate this force. So this is the rigid rod, which is one link of the chain. And then here is the little flexible filament that will connect it to the next rigid rod. And then you've got to imagine the next ruler would be here and would be the next link in the chain. And so it is resting on the uh, pot, so on a hard surface. And then it's going to be lifted at this end. And what you can see is that when it is lifted at this end, it will start to rotate. And if I lift it really fast, you hear a bang. And that bang is the far end of the ruler moving down and striking the table, and therefore being pushed up by the table which is that anomalous push from the pot, which explains our fountain. A nice, simple question would be to ask what would happen if you increase the drop between the pot and the floor? So this fountain is releasing gravitational energy as the chain falls from the pot level to the floor level. And the more energy it releases, so the larger this drop is, the faster the chain will move. Now, if the chain is dropping further, and hence moving faster, then in this little picture here, Right. If this link moves faster, it pulls harder on the next link. And so this link is pulled around more violently and it bounces off the table more violently and there is a bigger push from the pot. So the prediction, therefore, would be that the bigger this drop is, the bigger this force is, and therefore the bigger the fountain will be. So to test our prediction that a bigger drop should lead to a bigger fountain, we've come to a rather grand staircase at the Royal Society, which we must have at least a 10 metre drop and so let's make a fountain and see how big it is. We invented two new chains uh, to think about this process. So the first chain is quite literally macaroni on a string. And this chain conforms really rather well to this idea, so a rigid rod, and then a very flexible spacer, and then a rigid rod, so a macaroni rod, then a little piece of string, and then a macaroni rod. And so we predict that that chain should produce a nice fountain. And then we have a second chain, which I have here, which consists of little very heavy beads separated by long distances of flexible thread. And we predict this chain should not work at all. And so we can draw a little diagram here of this chain which looks a little bit more like this. It's got a bead and then a flexible nylon thread and then another bead and then a flexible nylon thread and then another bead. And what you can see is that if we imagine this is the one that is about to come into motion, it is being pulled up in this direction by the next one. But when this one is pulled, it's not going to kick back down onto the table because first of all, it's not going to rotate very much because it's small 
And secondly, even if it does rotate, it's a sphere, so it will just turn on its own shape, and it will not kick down onto the table underneath. And so our prediction is that the macaroni, which resembles this chain, should make a nice fountain, but the chain made of beads separated by flexible uh, filaments should not make it fountain. So I have here our macaroni chain, which is made of rigid rods, uh, which we're expecting to make quite a nice fountain. Uh, so let's drop it and see what happens. And then I have here our chain consisting of heavy beads collected by uh, long, slender threads, which we think should not make a fountain. And so we'll drop that and see whether that's true as well. The children can find information about this by going to the Rutherford School's Physics Project um, website and looking at the materials that are available, including suites of problems about chains, arches, bridges, um, and uh, mathematically connected problems to this uh, research problem that we've been discussing. The chain fountain is obviously great fun, and we've had fun doing the research to, behind uh, explaining it, and millions of people have watched it, but it's actually characteristic of a very wide class of uh, problems in physics. And these are ones where things are set into motion and they lose half of their energy during the setting into motion. So for instance, an example is the carrying of coal or ore or gravel on a conveyor belt, that when you put it onto the conveyor belt, the conveyor belt is having to put in twice as much energy as appears in the energy of motion of the coal that's on it. So we're scratching at the underlying physics of a wide range of problems that are very uh, important in technology and in science generally. Also in pure problems, for instance, in astrophysics. So we are looking to try and exploit the surprises that Steve Mould uh, revealed in a much wider range of problems um, that we're working on and we hope that the children will work on as well.